What does a volunteer scientist in Tacloban, Philippines do? Working around the city devastated by Typhoon Haiyan 10 years ago. You may find it interesting, you may find it shocking, but I hope it inspires you to do something similar, whether you're a scientist or not. First things first, I'm a doctor, not a scientist. And I made some videos about volunteering as a doctor in the Philippines, which proved to be quite popular on this channel. However, the real behind the scenes hero here is my fiance, who organized this volunteering experience for both of us. And she's the scientist that you've come here to see. It's not often that you see scientists volunteering around the world. Usually it's doctors, nurses, sometimes paramedics, but scientists are often the unsung heroes of our healthcare system. And I'm so proud of my fiance because she really had to go outside of her scope of practice and do things that she would never usually do back at home in her usual role back in Australia. This video that you're about to see is about what she got up to from her perspective. I cannot take any of the credit for this. She did all the scripting, the narrating, the editing of this video, and she let me upload it onto my channel. I think you're really gonna enjoy this one. So without further ado, this is the life of a volunteer scientist in Tacloban City, Philippines. As you all know, my fiance Chris and I are doing volunteer work in the Philippines on the island of Leyte. Let me share some of our incredible experiences with you. Imagine living in a house made of bamboo or tin with no windows and little to no electricity in suffocating heat and humidity. That's the reality for many in the remote villages around Babatnyon where we volunteer. But despite these challenges, the spirit of the people here are unbreakable. Around Tacloban and Babatnyon, you still see the scars left by Typhoon Haiyan, one of the deadliest tropical cyclones in history. Our homestay mum, Adi Tess, shared haunting stories about the 22,000 body bags sent by the United Nations, and they still weren't enough, despite the news only reporting 7,000 deaths. Get international help to come here, now. Not tomorrow, now. This is really, really like bad, bad, worse than hell. Smell of rotting human flesh is so Most people we met so spoke about two different lives, the one before the typhoon and the life after they survived. No, so very angry and thirsty. Seeing the abandoned houses on our way to work is a daily reminder of the tragedy. We live in the more developed town of Tacloban and travel one to two hours to remote rural villages, mostly by motorbike. Some remote villages are only accessible by boat. Our homestay offers modest but comfortable facilities, including an enclosed room with mosquito protection and an electric fan. Due to low water pressure community-wide, running water is unavailable. So our homestay family fills two large buckets for all our needs, flushing the toilet, washing hands and bathing. Although we lack cell service at home, the Volunteer Centre, which is a short walk away, provides air conditioning and Wi-Fi. The major clinic of Babatnyon is called RHU. However, it was not on Google Maps. A lot of things are not on Google Maps here. Dr. Julieta is the only public doctor in the Babatnyon region. She is a highly trained paediatrician who could have worked in bigger cities for a bigger wage, but chose to return to her hometown in order to care for the people who need it most. Every day, she and her cute dog Goma greet the patients at the clinic, improving and saving countless lives on the daily. Medical resources here are limited. Every test costs money which patients need to pay and cannot afford, so we often rely on trial and error with medicines. On our first day, a woman with a severe head wound from a motorbike accident walked away with just stitches because a scan would have cost two months wages. It's a harsh reality that we've had to adapt to. Lab tests here are limited. Only the main Babatnyon clinic offers pregnancy tests, HIV finger prick tests, and microscopic analysis of urine, feces, and sputum. Mona, the sole medical technologist, handles these. This video is from the annual Pregnant Beauty Pageant, which is a wonderful initiative to educate women on nutrition, possible complications, and to celebrate their beauty by strutting down the runway. I conducted the HIV testing while Mona managed translation and administration. Each barangay has a dedicated midwife or nurse. However, they are not present every day as their schedules are divided among multiple clinics. Many local nurses speak good English, having completed their university degrees in the language. We have been fortunate to have their assistance in translating, as most locals only speak Warai. Sherwin, the nurse we have spent most of our time with, has been an excellent interpreter and local guide. He introduced us to one of their most beloved extracurricular activities, rooster fighting. 
the vegetarian in me crying. The day prior to arriving in the remote towns and islands, the midwife or nurse spread word to the locals that a doctor is coming. An overwhelmingly large crowd of people will be awaiting our arrival to get help. We would also do some home visits for the patients unable to walk to the clinic. These local clinics are not immune to common community issues of frequent blackouts, no electricity, and ability to get clean-ish water. Some had no bucket to manually flush the toilet, making the workday particularly unpleasant. Even disposable gloves can be a rarity. Another unexpected challenge was not having cell service. Imagine trying to calculate paediatric doses without Google. I once had to get the local children oh to run guys. me to a coin-operated Wi-Fi box so I could frantically Google the calculations and race them back to Chris in the clinic. Each barangay has a frequent fiesta, which is basically a loud, festive community gathering where they give out free agricultural seeds and food, dental checkups, haircuts and medical consultations. Noise levels reach over a painful 95 decibels, making it difficult to hear the patients and the nurse interpreting, which in conjunction with the 30 plus degree heat makes it physically and mentally taxing. We've had to carry around earplugs as our sensitive eardrums cannot handle the powerful Filipino loudspeakers. Being presented with complicated cases only specialists would handle in the West. Two cases of Bell's palsy, severe skin conditions, urofibromatosis, babies with whooping cough and polio, to name a few. We have felt helpless in many situations. At one of the barangay fiestas, a 63-year-old patient with unmanaged diabetes and hypertension unmanaged because she couldn't afford the medicine, came for help. She had severe vomiting, dizziness and numbness, which made us suspect she was in ketoacidosis, but we had no glucometer strips and she refused to travel to the mainland hospital. Solution? Give her what we had, not much, and prescribe the rest of the medicine she can't afford. Dr. Julieta reassured us that we just had to do the best we could with the little that we had. A patient on one of the islands off Babatnyon had a stroke two months prior, but due to the power cut, couldn't contact anyone to take them to the mainland. Chris and I were the first healthcare providers they had seen. She was wheelchair bound, unable to eat and drink without help, let alone swallow pills, and had severe gout and hypertension. Although we felt out of our depth and wished we could do more, the alternative was that these individuals might never receive any medical attention. With the little testing available, I've had to wear many hats, doing things which would be unheard of back home, especially for a scientist. From doing backyard medical treatments, literally, immunizations, prenatal checks, writing scripts, I know all the local medicine doses off by heart now, riding 160 kilometers per hour on a long, busy, uncomfortable, bumpy road with dangerously large potholes in an ambulance fanning the patient due to the lack of airflow. Chris almost fainted, patient vomited. And delivering babies. High risk 42 year old mum with her eighth pregnancy. Refused to go to the main hospital. Team consisted of one newly qualified midwife, one experienced midwife, Dr. Chris, who had only seen one birth as a medical student, a scientist, me, and the utilities officer of no medical qualifications. Each day brings new surprises and reminds me of the incredible resilience of the people here. Despite the challenges, this has been one of the biggest and most fulfilling accomplishments of my life. The kindness and generosity of the Filipinos have truly blown us away. This place will forever hold a special place in my heart. There'll be many people who will be hard to say goodbye to. The local kids, our homestay family, Dr. Julieta, and the amazing nurses and midwives. This experience has been nothing like I imagined it would be. It's better. It has exceeded all my expectations. I have constant reminders of you all, and words cannot express my gratitude to Sefid, Laz, Pooja, Ewan, Dave, and each one of you for supporting me accomplish this lifelong dream. I will be forever thankful. Thank you for making this possible. I hope you enjoyed that one. I'm so proud of my fiance who really put herself out there, going well beyond her scope of usual practice and taking on responsibilities that are just unheard of for scientists. I think this really highlights that 
Anyone of any background can help here. So if you're interested in volunteering in and around Takaman City, or you just want to see what you can do to help, leave a comment below and I'll get back to you. Give the video a like if you think she did an amazing job. If you enjoyed that video, you may want to see the video from my experience as a volunteer doctor in the Philippines, Takaman City. I'll see you there.